Hello and welcome to Science Monitor, your favorite weekly program on what's happening in the field of science and technology in and around the country. First of all, let's take a look at the headlines. Science Express takes off with the mission of creating awareness about India's biodiversity. Researchers propose a new antibiotic that prevents the development of drug resistance in pathogens. Professor M. S. Swaminathan stresses on the need of cultivating nutrition-rich crops. Wheatgrass beneficial for patients of thalassemia and leukemia. And in our segment in focus this week, we'll discuss about diarrhea in children and its prevention. And now news in details. Nowadays, a train is travelling to different parts of the country to create awareness about the enormous biodiversity of our motherland. Having covered a distance of 1 lakh kilometres last year, this train, aptly named as Science Express, has once again resumed its journey for this year. In a major step towards creating awareness on India's biodiversity, the third phase of Science Express Biodiversity Special was flagged off from Subdajang Railway Station, New Delhi on 28 July 2014. Science Express Biodiversity Special, also known as SEBS, is an innovative exhibition on wheels. This train aims to create awareness about the exceptional biodiversity of India and its protection. The train after flag off started for Kurukshetra and will be covering 57 locations in a span of 194 days and is expected to benefit about 30 lakh students across the country. Originally known as Science Express, the mobile exhibition mounted on a special 16 coach AC train was launched in October 2007. Acting as a platform to showcase the achievements of science to the people, the train completed the India-wide tour in four phases covering 1 lakh kilometers and 335 locations. It was visited by over 1.09 crore people in 1205 exhibition days. In 2012, the train was redesigned as Science Express Biodiversity Special to align with the UN theme of Decade of Biodiversity 2011-2020. It showcased the rich biodiversity of India to delegates from over 190 countries in October 2012 when India chaired the Conference of Parties to the Convention on Biodiversity. Since the launch in 2012, the Science Express Biodiversity Special Train has covered 114 stations and travelled across more than 37,000 kilometres in the first two phases and covered 62 locations and over 22 lakh people, including 5 lakh students and 29,000 teachers from 6,005 schools. Science Express Biodiversity Special targets a wide audience mainly focusing on school and college students and teachers. Biodiversity is a, is a unique part of that. This train basically started with the conference of parties in Hyderabad in 2012. And this is the third phase of it. But over the over the six phases earlier, between the science and the biodiversity, almost a crore of people, people have seen it. And what we find is that people who come here, they get so charged up that they go back to their schools, go back to their families and start doing activities. So it is not just a passive viewing, it is, it is something which, which hopefully will become a momentous occasion in their lives. So that is the type of response we are getting. Eight coaches of the train contain the exhibits of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change on Biodiversity of India spread in different biogeographical zones. The exhibits also cover other aspects like the marine, coastal, agro, microbial and forest biodiversity and their linkages with our livelihoods. Focus is also on the steps for conservation of biodiversity. In the other coaches, Department of Science and Technology has put up exhibits on themes like climate change, conservation of energy and water, sustainable development etc. The train also contains a special kids zone for fun-filled activities and puzzles in science, mathematics and environment for kids along with the joy of science, GOS, hands-on lab for learning through simple experiments. The emergence of antibiotic-resistant pathogens worldwide has been a cause of alarm in the recent years. 
If left uncontrolled, this can elevate into a global crisis with serious consequences. Addressing this issue, researchers of Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research Bangalore have developed a new antibiotic that prevents the process of drug resistance in disease-causing microorganisms. Let us see how this new development can solve the problem of drug-resistant pathogens. The increasing reports of emergence of antibiotic-resistant pathogens worldwide have been a cause of alarm in the recent years. Today, a wide range of pathogens, including the bacteria that cause tuberculosis, the viruses that cause influenza, the parasites that cause malaria and the fungi that cause yeast infections are becoming resistant to the currently available drugs used for treatment. Scientists are predicting that the day is not far when all the existing antibiotics will prove ineffective against all the known pathogens. In this scenario, a new chemical compound developed by researchers of Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Bengaluru, could be the ultimate solution. The team of researchers led by Dr. Jayanta Haldar has developed a new antibiotic which reduces the chances of the microorganisms becoming resistant to drugs. This novel compound functions by targeting the pathogen's cell membrane, in turn disrupting several functions. While the currently available antibiotics work by targeting specific cellular functions which can be repaired, the destruction of cell membrane cannot be repaired and kills the pathogen. The compound is designed to block the mutations that happen in bacterial cell which help them develop drug resistance. While the team has filed for patent for this invention in India, US, Australia, Canada, Europe and South Korea, it might take 20 more years for the compound to be tested for toxicity and reach the market after clinical trials. Our compounds have a multimodal action against bacteria. They can inhibit cell wall biosynthesis like any other glycopeptide antibiotics such as vancomycin. They also have an additional mechanism of action. They act on bacterial cell membrane and disrupt the membrane integrity. There are other semi-synthetic glycopeptides that act on cell membrane but at high concentration very weakly. In contrast to our compounds, act on the bacterial membrane at very low concentration and kill bacteria. Important, none of the known glycopeptides act on such broad range of drug resistant bacteria strain like our compounds. It is often observed that practices like not completing full course of prescribed medications or taking antibiotics for viral infections stimulate some of the bacterial cells to undergo mutation and acquire drug-resistant capacity. As a result, patient starts failing to respond to the drug which was effective in previous years. Such practices of antibiotic misuse is on rise in India and this novel drug once in the market may prove to be a boon to tackle many drug-resistant superbugs. A two-day conference to extend the understanding pertaining to food security and nutrition in South Asian countries was organized in New Delhi recently. During the conference, renowned Indian geneticist M. S. Swaminathan spoke on the need of cultivating crops which not only addresses the issue of adequate food supply but also ensures sufficient nutrition. Let's take a look at the report to understand how important this is. Malnutrition remains a major developmental challenge in many of the South Asian countries and other parts of the developing world. It is estimated that South Asia has the largest number of malnourished children in the world and their numbers are growing at an alarming rate. Addressing this concern, a group of organizations from the Coalition for Food and Nutrition Security in India organized the South Asia Conference on Policies and Practices to Improve Nutritional Security 2014 on 30th and 31st July 2014 in New Delhi. Well, the, the whole objective of the uh, South Asia Conference is to bring together uh, uh, various experts, practitioners, researchers, uh, civil society organizations and uh, um, and, the, and as well as uh, the government uh, and the media together, including also the private sector, uh, together to look at the issues of nutrition that is in South Asia and in India and uh, how uh, the evidence from the ground level and from the practitioner's perspective uh, can inform policy and policy as well as uh, uh, then improve the practice itself. Uh, so that is the whole idea of this two-day uh, two conference. 
The conference was aimed at understanding the problem of malnutrition and possible strategies to address the issue from various experiences from South Asian countries. The conference saw the participation of over 400 participants from South Asian countries, mainly from India, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka and a few delegates from the US, Canada, Africa and Europe. The participants discussed on various themes like nutrition through life course, nutrition education and innovation, community nutrition programs, gender and equity in nutrition, nutrition monitoring, etc. Special focus was on the nutritional policies and programs where the representatives shared their experience and research results. There were discussions about all aspects of nutrition policies, practices and programs primarily from South Asian countries that have been successful in lowering malnutrition rates. The conference was attended by many prominent scientists. Speaking on the occasion, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, the renowned Indian geneticist, stressed on the need of cultivation crops which not only address the issue of adequate food supply but also ensures sufficient nutrition. Of course, the United Nations now has also started the Zero Hunger Challenge and I will mention it very briefly. Before that, let me say the organization I represent, that is the Coalition for Food and Nutrition Security, was really formed on the 60th anniversary of our independence, 19, uh, 2007. We felt at least from the 60th anniversary, Mahatma Gandhi's goal of a hunger-free India, we should work much more seriously. The conference is expected to generate a framework for action to improve nutrition and food security in developing nations and address and future challenges of nutritional security. Wheatgrass could be a beneficial cure for the patients of thalassemia and leukemia. This encouraging news has come into light as a result of experiments conducted by a team of researchers from Kolkata. This finding can be of great help as wheatgrass is widely available and can be procured at a reasonable price. Plus, it can be grown at home. Let us see the report to know the details of this interesting finding. In an exciting new study, researchers of Netaji Subhash Cancer Research Institute, NSCRI, Kolkata, in collaboration with National Research Institute of Ayurvedic Drug Development, NRIADD, Ministry of Health and Neil Ratan Sarkar Medical College, Kolkata, have proved that wheatgrass could be a lifesaver for patients suffering from blood disorders like thalassemia and leukemia. The study was pursued after an interesting observation that regular intake of wheatgrass juice as a nutritional supplement increased the hemoglobin levels and reduced the frequency of blood transfusion in thalassemia and leukemia patients. We started the, our work with wheatgrass juice in the way year 2002 when our cancer and thalassemia patients were given fresh wheatgrass juice as a nutritional supplement. Surprisingly, we have seen that both in leukemia and thalassemia patients, the blood transfusion requirement is becoming less and less. The results of the study published in European Journal of Medicinal Plants and Natural Product Research shows the potency of active ingredients present in wheatgrass. Researchers have shown that two derivatives of a compound called mugenic acid extracted from the roots of 7 to 10 days old wheatgrass and methyl pheophorbide A extracted from the aerial parts of the plant shows important biological activity called iron chelating property. Due to this property, these compounds help to drain out excessive iron from the system of thalassemia and leukemia patients. Various tests done on biological models also prove that these active ingredients are non-toxic. Besides, methyl pheophorbide A is known to possess antioxidants and anti-cancerous properties. Studies conducted by team on a group of 200 random patients also show that patients administered with wheatgrass juice respond better in terms of removal of iron than the ones treated on commonly used medications like desiferol and desirox. Wheatgrass juice has been used in Ayurveda as a nutritional supplement since ancient times and is known to be rich in vitamin A, C, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, sulphur, cobalt, 
zinc and proteins. With this novel discovery regarding the activity on stabilizing hemoglobin levels, ingredients from wheatgrass juice can now be an effective and affordable replacement for the usual drugs used for removal of excess iron in thalassemia and leukemia patients. Four Indian teams are participating in the contest on autonomous underwater vehicles designed by students being conducted in the United States. One of the team comprises of students of IIT Madras who are presenting their innovative design in the contest. To know more about the contest and the Indian teams, let us see this report. The 17th annual International RoboSub competition organized by AVUSI Foundation in collaboration with US Office of Naval Research started at San Diego, California on July 28. The competition that aims to advance the development of autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVs and maritime robotics will end on August 3, 2014. The participants of this competition are required to create novel robotic technologies that can perform realistic missions in an underwater environment. This year, four teams from India are participating in the event. This includes Delhi Technological University, Indian Institute of Technology Mumbai, Indian Institute of Technology Madras and Team Bangalore Robotics. Autonomous underwater vehicles AUVs are intelligent robots which can swim freely and are capable of carrying out various predefined tasks autonomously in the harsh underwater environment. They are self-guided and battery-operated vehicles used for exploration of deep oceans unreachable using common remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. As an entry into the RoboSub competition, the team comprising 19 undergraduate students from Indian Institute of Technology Madras have designed and developed an autonomous underwater vehicle called AUV Amok. AUV Amok, initially designed and tested as a remotely operated vehicle and later revamped into an AUV, is a hydrodynamic dual hull, heavy bottom underwater vehicle. We have researched a lot about the underwater projects. So uh, there, are many, uh, there are many tasks which are presently being carried out manually. Suppose we take some shallow water applications like uh, the uh, inspection of underwater bridges or the inspection of the uh, underwater part of the ships. They are presently being carried out manually. So ma if, if carried out manually, there is a, there is a probabil probability of having some error. So we thought why not to uh, make it autonomous and having such an autonomous vehicle which can go to certain depths take some images of the bridges or some images or do some analysis on the underwater part of the ship and bring out some results the uh, the burden on the human shoulders will be less and they can like uh, analyze more on the uh, results being taken out by the vehicle AUV Amog is equipped with five thrusters and is powered using lithium polymer batteries the design of this AUV has been customized to help complete the tasks defined in AUVSI's RoboSub and NIOT's SAFE competitions. The sensing solution of this design includes IMU and pressure sensors for orientation and depth feedback along with underwater cameras. The architecture of Amog is easily scalable and fully customizable. Hence, it can be upgraded to a scientific, industrial and commercial version using application-specific oceanographic sensors. The team aims to use AUV AMOG for crucial shallow water applications such as inspection of underwater bridges and ship hulls. Time to take a very short break here. We'll be back. Keep watching Science Monitor. Welcome back. After the break, you are watching Science Monitor. Diarrhea poses a major threat to the health of young children. It claims at least 23 lives every hour worldwide. A little care and early treatment can save children from this diarrhea. The National Diarrhea Control Program aims to reach out to the people and create awareness regarding the simple and easy to follow measures to prevent this disease. How can we save our children from the deadly clutches of diarrhea? Let us learn in our segment in focus. Often dismissed as non-serious and easily cured ailment, 
diarrhea is a major cause of concern in many of the developing countries including India. It would be shocking for many to know that diarrhea assumes the third place in terms of child mortality in our country. It is estimated that over 2 lakh children succumb to diarrhea annually in India. Doctors describe diarrhea as the condition of having at least 3 loose or liquid bowel movements in a day. There are a wide range of factors known to cause diarrhea. The most common cause is an infection of the intestine by certain viruses, bacteria or parasites. Such a condition is known as gastroenteritis. Viral infection of the intestine that usually lasts for two days and is sometimes called intestinal flu or stomach flu. These infections are often acquired from contaminated food or water or directly from another person who is infected. Diarrhea is also a common symptom of cholera and typhoid. In young children, certain medications and allergic reactions to certain food also result in diarrhea. A condition known as lactose intolerance in which the individual is unable to digest the lactose present in the milk also causes diarrhea. Diarrhea may be broadly divided into three types namely short duration watery diarrhea, short duration bloody diarrhea which is also called dysentery and if it lasts for more than two weeks it is called persistent diarrhea. Symptoms of diarrhea may vary from frequent loose or watery stools to abdominal bloating or cramps, nausea and vomiting. In serious cases, there may be blood, mucus or undigested food in the stool accompanied by rapid weight loss and fever. The most dangerous side effect of diarrhea is dehydration caused by loss of fluid and salts from the body. Signs of dehydration include loss of the normal stretchiness of the skin, decreased urination, loss of skin color, fast heart rate and a decrease in responsiveness. If left untreated, severe dehydration caused by diarrhea can lead to death. However, simple measures and easy to follow practices exist to prevent and manage diarrhea. The two most important aspects of preventing and treating diarrhea involves following proper hygiene and avoiding dehydration. Improved sanitation, drinking clean water, avoiding consumption of outside food and regular hand washing after using toilets plays an important role in preventing diarrhea. Doctors recommend intake of plenty of fluid in case of diarrhea to avoid dehydration. Since plain water does not contain sugar, sodium or potassium which are also lost in diarrhea, it is important to consume oral rehydration solution or the ORS. ORS is available as packets or can be easily prepared at home using clean water with small amounts of salts and sugar along with zinc tablets. Doctors say that fruit juices and fizzy drinks make diarrhea worse in children. Children should be continuously fed with healthy food and soups and babies continue to be breastfed during diarrhea. In case of infants, doctors suggest breastfeeding for at least 6 months and vaccination against rotavirus. Addressing the need of more awareness regarding the management of diarrhea, India is observing National Level Intensified Diarrhea Control Fortnight IDCF, during 28th July to 8th August 2014. The program is focused on activities which include awareness generation on hygiene, establishing more ORS zinc corners, encouraging ASHA volunteers to reach out to families and provide oral rehydration solution packets, etc. And what are the contributions of science to this week's history? Let us learn in our next segment, History of Science. The first man to put his foot on moon, Neil Armstrong was born on August 5, 1930. Armstrong had created history traveling to the moon on Apollo 11 spaceship. During the mission, Neil Armstrong and his other colleague Edwin Aldrin had collected some samples of soil and rocks from the surface of the moon to help study the environment of the Earth's only satellite. Apart from this enormous feat, Neil Armstrong was the first civilian pilot to dock two spacecrafts during his Gemini 8 mission. The great British chemist Alexander Fleming was born on August 6, 1881. Fleming was the first chemist to have invented the first ever antibiotic in the world called penicillin. Alexander Fleming was honored with the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1945. 
well known Indian scientist and the progenitor of the Green Revolution in India, Professor M. S. Swaminathan was born on August 7, 1925. He had dreamt of relieving the country of mass scale food crisis and researched extensively on high yielding varieties of wheat and rice. His research gave the country access to such seed varieties that could produce high yield even in water shortage conditions. Let us now have a look at some important science and technology activities happening in India and abroad in our segment Science Express. In a function held at Vigyan Bhavan, New Delhi, the Ministry of Earth Sciences on 27th July celebrated its Foundation Day. The day celebrated the Ministry's contributions towards providing the nation with services in forecasting the monsoon and other weather or climate parameters. On this occasion, many researchers and young students across the nation were awarded and given certificates of merit for their outstanding contributions in the field of earth and environmental sciences. Delhi Zoo has recently initiated a major revamp plan centering on making the premises friendlier for animals and keeping the animals active. Under this program, the existing enclosures of various species are being refurbished. The authorities are also planning to install swings for chimpanzees, wooden logs in the elephant enclosures, artificial nests for free-living birds and food baskets for deer species. Officials anticipate that these measures, besides giving a new look to the facility, will make the animals stay active and healthy. The Delhi Zoo authorities are also working towards providing bird-watching facilities to the visitors by December and installing new set of signboards with better descriptions. In an astonishing new discovery, NASA spacecraft Cassini has discovered 101 geysers on Saturn's moon Enceladus. The spacecraft Cassini, using heat-sensing instruments to collect data, has found that the geysers are erupting from a row of fractures in the sea trapped beneath Enceladus's ice shell. The discovery has excited the scientists as water is considered the fundamental ingredient for harboring microbial extraterrestrial life. Spacecraft Cassini has now been surveying the moon Enceladus over a period of seven years. Responding to a supplementary Minister of State independent charge for science and technology, Jitendra Singh has informed the Lok Sabha that several NRI scientists working abroad have expressed willingness to work in India. He also said that government is working on an Indo-French scientific council to encourage exchange programs. That is all in this episode of Science Monitor. Do tell us how do you like our program? You can send your feedback and suggestions. Our email ID is news at vigyanprasar.gov.in. You can also write in to us at vigyanprasar C24, Kutub Institutional Area, New Delhi 110016. That is all for today. We will be back with fresh news stories on science and technology again next week. Till then, take care and goodbye.